So, does anyone like fungi? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> As if you could, wouldn't love fungi. Uh, so, they're quite difficult to, um, to identify. So, I won't go into much detail, and I'm not a, uh, I hope I've got the right presentation. Because I've made a few, I think it's the right one. I've made a few changes. And so, um, yes, they're very delicate and beautiful, but at the same time, very tricky to identify. And iNaturalist, when you put them on, no one really knows. That's why it's good to go to a project like Fungi Map, where you, you know, they're looking at more the ecology of where they're growing, which trees they're interacting with, and stuff like that. That's okay. You do not. You're not in shackles. <laughs> you can leave at any time. Um, so basically, uh, you've got, yes, we're going to look at the groupings. So that's like your basics of fungi ID. Like where do they fit into? Uh, so there's different shapes, and that's good because we can sort of put them into those groups based on, based on shapes. And as you can see here, there's a sort of some images from books and stuff. Um, but like, you know, they have, we'll have a cap, and then the cap that will have different types of gills and how they're really complex how the gills structure themselves out like how do they you know they're very close or a little bit apart or there's just like so much to actually understand in their actual structure so and the reason why fungi are important i should say is because they're just like the, the the recyclers of the world you know without them you would just choke entire forests um, because nothing would decompose and they're feeding the trees the trees are basically eating themselves through the fungal like through the fungi decomposing their limbs and their leaves, so that debris uh, that they create or the molecules that are created by them and invertebrates that that are shredders that are you know decomposing the wood then gets fed back to the trees again through symbiotic fungi on the roots that, that feed the trees. So the decomposers will decompose, and then the the uh, root symbiotic fungi will grab that nutrient and put it back into the tree. So really all of the nutrient in any, any ecosystem is held within the bio biota, within the insects, plants, uh, microorganisms. So the soil is really just mineral component that you need to extract the nutrients from. So all soils are extremely fertile. And so, but the only thing you need is those organisms to get those nutrients out, to get those micronutrients for other life forms to form. So fungi are this this driving mechanism for this uh, recycling and cycling of nutrients. So as you can see, some of them have um, teeth even. <laughs> so that's really cool to see. But if you just take a photo from the top, you won't know there are feet, uh, teeth on, on the bottom. So you need to sort of look under. And I use my phone upside down. And if you uh, angle it right, you'll see, and you can take a photo of the underside of the fungi. Uh, so it's all about what's really underneath for, for most of them. But there are things like jellies. Often you walk around and you see something kind of slimy and it's de so delicate and jelly-like. So there's jellies, there's puffballs, things that are... Actually, puffballs are normally uh, uh, symbiotic with uh, root trees, so they'll come up from the ground instead of wood. And they're often, like, if you touch it, you can see the spores flying off. They go up into the atmosphere and they nucleate with uh, water particles and they bring down rain, which is another really useful thing that fungi do. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and you can see the different, I should probably use this. So, yeah, pil pilius just means cap, stipe just means uh, stem. So these are just scientific terms for cap and stem. And you can see that this is a mushroom, but this one is a bracket, so that it just grows on the side of a tree or a, or a log. And recipinate or lobe, lobe just means fungi that have funny shapes that you can't really designate into a particular shape that's trumpet-like. And these are shapes that are just named, you know, you can just kind of, it's very gr uh, blurry <laughs> between the two, uh, you know, between the two designations of some of these. Like, it's not, that's not a very scientific way of doing it, but definitely we can group them. So we have uh, pear-shaped fungi, we have stars on earth stars and things. There's phallic fungi, there are cups that, you know, you can almost put like a little bit of water in there for insects and other creatures to drink. There's coral fungi, um, there's clubs, it's, it just keeps going. <laughs> but there's probably like nine or ten of these groups that you can put them into. This is a lovely book from like 1970s that I stole an image from just to show um, how to identify them or put them into these groups. Uh, so, you know, umbrella-shaped fungi with a stipe in the middle, that's, and that's normally gilt or they have a pore, so that's a nice distinction, once again, based on the underside. 
and cups look like this, and then corals, and you've got jellies, puffballs, stinkhorns, which have amazing, uh, how they look is just crazy. One of them is the alien butthole fungus, I call it, because <laughs> it's got this crazy alien-like looking red bit, and then the middle rim is covered in these chocolate-smelling, poo-smelling pores, spores, so it's basically a bumhole of an alien. I don't know what an alien looks like or what its butthole looks like, but I just, <laughs> it reminds me of that. Uh, so, yeah, so woody poor ones. So let's go into the guild ones. So we go through a whole group of guild fungi or mushroom looking like fungi. So underneath they'll have gills. They have a stipe right in the middle, and you can take, it's good to take both shots from underside and top side. So without the underside, you really no one can really identify it, really. So you need the underside. Another trick you can do is put a mirror underneath it, so carry a little mirror, and take a photo of the mirror image instead of trying to put your iPhone down there and like lie down on the ground and do it like I often have to do. <laughs> um, so some of them are really, really tiny. That's the ruby bonnet. I don't know species names. I only know some, so I'm not even going to go through them. But these are kind of common. Um, this is the... Um, they glow in the dark, these ones. And this was at 4 p.m. at Mary Cancros during a bio blitz. And I should say, this is actually all the most of the all of the images are from the Mary Cancros bio blitz two years ago, three years ago. So I was doing the fungi survey there. So that's at 4 p.m. raining, pouring, and we put in like a little you know um, jacket over it, and we're able to see it glow already. <laughs> so that was cool. Looks much better on my laptop. Some of them are just gorgeous little things, delicate and small and just pretty, just pretty. You know, and some of the stipes will be on the side, so that gives them a little bit of a different shape. They're not in the middle, um, but they're still gilled. Uh, when they're little, they start, they, their mycelium is fluffy all around, and it's really, really cool. Uh, these are, yep, yeah, these are, would you believe these are gills? They're modified gills. So, yeah, it's so crazy because they look like pores, and we're going to the polypores next. But um, these are modified gills, apparently. These glow in the dark as well. I've never seen them glow. I didn't even know for a while that they did. Um, so leathers, the leathery goblet, <laughs> Cymatoderma elegans, very common, can grow very large, very big. When they're, when they're young, they're really beautifully coloured with purple and pink sort of colours shining through, and then they get really big. And then water accumulates in the middle, and often animals will come and drink from them. So they're literally nature's cup. Yeah. So yeah. How long do these last for? Are they typically flowers per day, like our regular mushrooms? Or yeah, the so day? these can last for a very long time. And in fact, sometimes I watch them like go dry completely and then they come up again. Um, so, like, they sort of start reviving when the mycelium is still active. So these can be for a very long time, like the leathers. Um, is this like, oh, yeah, I haven't even told, told you the difference. Yeah, most of the guild ones, to be honest, will be ephemeral. They will be like sometimes a day or two or sometimes like a week, you know. Yeah. All depends on how the mycelium is structured or the what creates the fungi or the mushroom uh, and how that um, the type that it is and the strength that it has or the, the ferociousness it has uh, creates the actual mushroom itself. And the leathers and other things that are hardy obviously have a structure of the mycelium that is much different, and that's what makes the difference in the end. So leathers would last for longer than all those little mushrooms. But something like polypores uh, basically have, you know, they've still got the stipe, but they don't have the, uh, what do you call it? So these are the pores underneath. That's why, once again, when you look underneath, you might think it's a gilled mushroom when you see it, but then when you look underneath, you're like, ah, but look at all this pore structure. So that's where the spores come out from the gills or the pores, and that's how the fungi reproduce. So they're mature in there, and then they get dispersed. How beautiful is the red one, hey? Yeah. Stunning. So that's, I don't think that's, I didn't even put a thing. That's definitely not my image, but I didn't reference it. Sorry about that. Uh, polypores. So once again, if you have a magnifying glass, it's another useful thing to bring, because uh, you can see um, the pores. Uh, the tiniest little pores, and you can't, it's almost looking smooth, but then when you look with a magnifying glass, you see this world of wonder open up. And a lot of the pores and the gills have microscopic creatures living on them. So if you put them in water and look under the microscope, there'll be flagellates, there'll be all kinds of protozoans on there. Uh, 
and tiny little beetles and tiny little uh, springtails. Like it's like the whole world lives, like the whole universe lives inside the fungal structures as well. And they're consuming the fungi because they need to be decomposed too. Uh, so uh, this is actually an introduced species from Madagascar and apparently it's causing, like it's growing prolifically. Um, and we've got a white species, uh, Australian white species, but I actually love them. They're so pretty when you see them. They're on top of it, it's got tiny little, um, this one's a mature one, but they've got tiny little, like the skin top, it's got little bubbles, and it looks like a ping pong kind of thing, and the shape as well, like a bat, ping pong bat. Um, yep, yeah, so once again, these would have had very, very, very small pores. And then you've got the, you know, polypores that like Ganoderma, the really hardy stuff that you can build structures, grow materials from. So literally people are using these now, the mycelium of it, the thing that makes the fungi grow and that's proliferating in the wood. And it will actually, uh, if you give it wood or other substrate or like paper or any other thing, it will basically decompose it, but at the same time glue it all together so you can make bricks and buildings and people are building from these materials now, they're called micro-materials. But some of these things are really old and can grow giant. So most polypores, and this is a strange one too, because that's like a Ganoderma type of fungi where it kind of looks like it should be growing like this, but it's got a stipe. So they always have these weird, you know, they always surprise you. They're not boring. <laughs> They're like always like, you think it's something, you look at a microscope, microscopic evidence show one, shows one thing, and then but when you do a DNA analysis, it turns out it's a different species because they look so similar. That's why they're so hard. And we only know 50% of our fungi in Australia. So we don't know what's disappearing. We have no idea. There's no, hardly any fungi red listed. Like all the species have lists of, you know, plants and insects, animals, everything except for fungi has what's disappearing. We know what's, you know, what's going missing, like what's endangered. We don't have that for fungi. So mycologists are trying to really push to identify them so we can go, well, they're missing, they should be here, what's going on? Because without them, in the environment, like it's really, we can't survive without these guys because they feed trees, they, you know, how do we breathe without trees? We can't, so all plants actually require these things. So it's very, very difficult. Um, mycology is very underlooked and loved and unfunded, and it's a huge issue. Um, we don't even know the, just how big the problem is. So it's, uh, it's good to go out there and start taking pics of them and, you know, like to show that people care about them. Because I think when people start, when something like iNaturalist becomes a big thing for fungi, which it isn't at the moment, no one really knows us. People try to suggest American species because they know they fungi really well, but they're different. They're not, they're not the same species. So we don't know that, but a lot of the times people just look at a thing and go, oh, that must be that. But then when the analysis is done, where it's unfunded and we can't do the analysis, we... We just don't know what we have. So it's a it's a problem. So spines or teeth. I'm sorry I don't have really good images. I've got a better camera now, so I'll, if we go on the walk, we'll probably find some um, some cool structures underneath. But they literally can have spines or teeth. And then stink horns. <laughs> I think that was a stink horn. It looked like an eye of a crocodile or an alien or something sitting there. And I think it was literally just waiting to sprout a mushroom. I'm actually not sure, but I, I have a feeling that that's what it was. It was really cool. So sting horns. Oh, yeah, there's the Acerara rubra, that alien butthole fungus. <laughs> like, don't quote that name because that's just something I made up, but, you know, it's fun. <laughs> These are beautiful, the bridal veil. One day we had rain and that whole paddock in front of the bar was covered in the whole colony. Was it there? I think it was there. Somewhere on those grassy patches, so... A bit of mulch must have been dropped off because they like growing mulch and they stink and like that doesn't convince you just by get, getting the whiff, put your finger in it and smell it. I've done it once. <laughs> so the spores smell like poo but they're just spores for flies to take them away, you know. So it looks like poo, smells like poo but it's not poo. So you won't like get, you know, a disease from it. <laughs> um, puff balls. So these are beautiful shapes that... Um, pop up, so eventually when, the, when they get crusty and dry, they'll just release loads of spores, and it's really fun taking um, slow-mo videos of that, and you can like poke them, and they'll go Whoa. and it's really cool. And there's like crazy science done on how, uh, just how much um, the G-force required is like the same as launching a rocket. 
and also it's this faster than a bullet they did comparisons of shooting um, a bullet versus an ejaculation of one of those spores and like the difference uh, the yeah the difference in how fast it happens with a spore tiny little organism with you think very not very mechanically sort of but the water pressure and all of that just works to get these things out into the atmosphere it's very fascinating so you can go down the rabbit hole researching the stuff people have you know researched about spore dispersal this is one of my favorites it's just so beautiful it's a disc type of an ascomyces because fungi vary in two groups distinct groups so these guys are um just beautiful and they were quite large and they were just growing in mary king cross like on the log on the walk <laughs> like just right by uh, just during the bioblitz, which I was very lucky to find. They're white underneath, pure white. And these guys produce their spores, I think, from like any part of the structure. I've never seen them actually, you know, have like a spore dispersed. Like I've never seen them disperse spores. Oops, what am I doing? Some of them are tiny little cups. So these are discs and cups. Very, very cute. Very colorful. And we also have like paint or crust. So you can actually lift a log sometime. And sometimes when you're walking in the forest, or sometimes you just see it, and there's these beautiful, very nice to touch, because all of them will release water, so they're always cool. When the fungi are alive, when you touch them, they always have this cool, wet feel to them, because they're transpiring. Uh, so these paints just grow, um, or crusts, they'll just grow on the log and consume it. They don't really produce uh, a fruiting body. And of course there's coral fungi as well, which are just... I mean, I'd love to show you more magnificent photos, but I don't have any in here, I don't think. No. But, you know, they come in different colours, like purples, reds, oranges. They're just stunning things. And they literally look like coral. It's, not, you know, the mind boggles. Um, and then we've got jellies and <laughs> the wood ear fungi. They, like, literally look like human ears sometimes, some of the species. But it's really, really cool to touch as well because they're really jelly-like. So don't be afraid to touch fungi. There's only a few that are really poisonous and you'd have to eat them to be poisoned. So, you know, be gentle. Don't don't disrupt them too much, but they're really fun to touch. <laughs> so that's a nice jelly, really jelly-like fungi. Tremelin, I think it's called. Uh, clubs. <laughs> so these are often called dead men's fingers because some of them have these shapes where they come out from the ground like zombies. Uh, so often that's the term they give them. Not these particular ones, but very similar thing. They just come up and they're called xyleria. Uh, do we have time? I've got 15 minutes. Where is Cal? Is he already here? I think I'll really rush through this. Do you guys want to listen to the next part about yeah. classification? So like the features we look for. So we've got, um, these are introduced, but they like the European and North American fund that, you know, everyone knows this one, right? Like, even though it doesn't, shouldn't be in Australia. Mycorrhizal, so feeding um, trees. But the good thing about this mushroom is really easy to show um, you know, the structure and how it relates. So they form this egg um, called the vulva, I think. Yep, you've got the vulva sac. So at the beginning, it's just like an egg, and then the mushrooms, the stipe starts sprouting up, or the head actually starts coming up. And then the remnants of the vulva are left on the uh, cap, and that's what you get, that little white pouch. The vulva ends up being on top of the mushroom. <laughs> so they're called warts. Uh, and you know you can see that there's different the pad that's the pallius the, the ring there's also a ring around its um, top as well there's gills so there's all of these features that you can look at and when you use scientific keys to identify them you look at those so you literally whoops I think I lost an image it feels like in there um, what is in there once again you've just got all these components so sometimes like a cortinarius which are beautiful purple fungi they'll have this um, like cortina, which is like a web left on from their um, from their growth, and basically that grabs their spores, and their spores are rusty. So you know it's a cortinarius because it has the cortina, which is the web, and it often has rusty spores stuck when they're sporulating. So you can just go, oh, I know that's a cortinarius. So in some species, or some groups of fungi, I should say, some gen genus, um, in all the genuses, you can kind of go and uh, know that that's what it is because it's got that particular feature you know so so if i'd walk around and found found that i'd go oh i know that's a quaternarius doesn't mean much really but what it does say for example is that that's a mycorrhizal or root symbiotic fungus so you get to know its ecology 
And you know, when you start walking around and with Fungi Map, when you go to our naturalist and put your photos through Fungi Map, it asks you, was it found on a piece of wood? Was it in the ground? What was the, was it a sclerophyll forest? Was it a rainforest? And that gives the ecologists an idea of the ecosystem health based on the fungi that are found within that ecosystem. So if we start noticing that Cortinarius is gone, and that's a mycorrhizal species, we know the trees are not getting fed if we're not getting these fungi there. So do you know what I mean? It's like the whole ecosystem has to be looked at, and that's what projects like Fungi Map try to do, assess the diversity as, as well as the ratios of different particular groups of fungi to assess the ecosystem health. And of course, if you have fires go through or we do control burning, we're losing all these species, especially if it's done or happens over time a lot. And they're very water dependent. So fungi will disappear if things burn all the time. A majority of them will. Uh, or maybe, I don't know, they'll survive in space and come down with rain one day. Who knows? I don't know what the future holds. But it's really important to try and conserve them. So once again, you know, in here we've got, you guys see my mouse, if I go like this. Yeah, so once again, you know, there's remnants, so that's an identifying feature. We've got paws in here, but we've got gills here. And they all have different names, beautiful names like the hymenium, <laughs> which are the structures uh, within the spores, pore structures, tubes of pores. Um, the annulus, which is the leftover little skirt around the stipe. So all of these basically identify the mushroom. But then you can go into the microscopic features and do a spore print, and I'll show you some later, and look at whether it forms like a basidium, which is a um, just the, one, the basidium mycetes form one type of a structure where the spores get born on, or the aspermycetes, and they're very different, so you can tell which group it belongs in, and they've just diverged in evolution, so they're two different distinct groups. And the spore shape, of course, as well. Some have ornaments on them. You can just keep going down the rabbit hole, and in the end, you still need... Uh, uh, you know, an analysis of the DNA usually in Australia because we know so little. And because they, you know, when they separate it over time, there will be subspecies and maybe different species forming all the time. But that's the main features, your cap, your gills, your stalk, we <coughs> talked about that. The hyphae, which is the mycelium, so conglomerate of hyphae underground, in this case, because growing underground, or going through the wood, is called the mycelium, which you can think of like mycelium, to remember the word, if you don't already remember it, because it's been sort of really popular lately. <laughs> uh, yeah, once again, same thing. I'm just showing it over and over again, just to, in different representations. But you don't need to know that. You don't really, you only really need to know those names, like annulus and hymenium and stuff, if you've got to sit down and work through a key to identify something. That's really when you need it the most. Um, but once again, another feature, how the gills attach. Are they attached to the stipe or are they, you know, adnexed? Which is, so all this terminology just describes how the gills are, you know, in, are in relationship to the stipe. So they vary so much. Uh, yeah. And then you've got ridges, you know, they're all modified. In this middle image, you have like the teeth, as I spoke about before. It's, and it's all how the spore-bearing structure is structured, um, or the surface is structured. And once again, here we've got cap morphology. Does it have a, what's it called? Campenulate, that means this little nipple at the top. Or is it conical in shape? Or is it convex? Or is it <laughs> depressed? There's so many variants. So once again, if you go through that process, you'll be able to group which group it comes into if you're using a scientific key for a particular group of fungi. So more features, that's just exactly what I've described, but in a different format. So the things to look at are base types. So oftentimes, if you're going to pick up a mushroom to actually ID it, you'd have to dig the base as well, because there's like a whole identifying feature you might have missed if you broke the fungi off half, you know, just ripped it out of the ground without taking the base. Uh, the stem shape is all very important as well. So they, you know, might be thin or thick or has a bulb on the bottom or is like tapered on the bottom. Uh, the margins, like how the margins actually look when you look on the side of the fungi, and it's often you need to um, cut it in half. And the different ring types, whether it's a skirt or a little funnel that sits in, or the remnant of is sitting on top of the stipe. The gill types, like how are they formed, like how are they shaped, how many are there in each individual section, 
how short and long they are. It's like really complex. Um, peculiar attachment, we talked about that, and the cup shape, and the texture. So all of these things you would, if you go out on a foray with the Queensland Mycological Society, you'd be looking at that if you're trying to identify something you picked. Same thing, just set in a different way, how about going for time under 10 minutes. So I've explained all that already, just another representation. So you can literally go online and start looking through these images. Uh, once again, the same thing, just a better way of showing the different um, shapes the margins. So you can see how varied they are as well. So all of that has its own uh, description. Scallop, for example, or striate. So that's uh, another way of describing what you found. And this is, mind you, just for the just for the um, uh, mushroom-shaped fungi, you know, with a stem in the middle. That's all we're talking about here. <laughs> so we're not even looking at the brackets or the caps or anything like that. We're just uh, cups, I should have said. So all of that, once again, how does the mushroom, uh, yeah, how is it in rolled margins or does it have rounded margins, just like here? I don't even know what obtuse means. <laughs> yeah, or acute, it's all very uh, up for investigation. The margin of the pileus, so the cap, once again, same thing. Curved, plain, straight, wow, even enrolled in volute, which also means in volute. You can see how the terminology starts, starts creeping into this. Uh, and then the gills, how beautiful are those gills? And they vary once again. See how there's like little intricacies, like folds of the gills in different areas? That all is a description. You would use that in a description. And tubes, these are the polypores, so they have tubes. Uh, and the, when you look at them, when you look underneath, it will just be pores. You're not seeing the tubes unless you cut it. And the color that comes, uh, that, that you know, is, is also an identifying feature. Some of the, uh, yeah, mycologists will know if I cut this and it turns this color as it oxidizes, that's an identifying feature. That's what I know that is that because it changed color to this color. So it's pretty cool, very involved. And also the attachment of the stem to the cap varies. <laughs> you can see stipless means like a bracket right at the end there. So without a stipe, so it's got no stem, it's just attached to whatever surface it's growing on. And the bottom, once again, as I mentioned earlier, if you don't dig out the full fungi, like the full specimen, you won't get the bottom. And the bottom can tell you a lot about which fungi it is based on its stipe um, and also the stipe. Um, itself, so like the shape of it, whether it's fat or thin or um, bulbous, very complex stuff. Um, some have membranes, so a lot of these uh, amenitas are the things that are like mycorrhizal growing in that symbiotic relationship with the partner trees. They'll have these little gorgeous little ornamentations, like little skirts on them. And you can tell it's an amenita when it has a skirt. And that's, that's, I love that image, that um, egg-like, that's when it starts to grow from its vulva. So that's a beautiful image. It looks like an egg <laughs> when you just like stumble across them sometimes, like, whoa. Now that's a cortinarius. Remember I described earlier the cortina? So it's like a web that the spores get then trapped on. And it's like when it's this color, you know, it's a cortinarius because the spores are literally, the individual tiny microscopic spore is rusty color. So these guys will always have rusty colored spores. That's it, I think. No, <laughs> microscopic features. Five more minutes, perfect. So remember how I said there's two different types of fungi, the Ascomyces and the Basidiomyces. All that means is they produce their spores differently on the uh, spore-bearing structures. So the Ascomyces have these spores in this, and this is all microscopy. So you need to have a microscope, you need to do a, a spore print. See ya. And, uh, and then you've got uh, the fungi basically, um, uh, the spores coming out of these structures. There's usually, I think, eight of these in there. And then the Basidiomyces have these little devils. They call them little devil horns. So they stick out and they produce their spore at the tip of this little devil horn. And that's how it works. So they're basically just two different forms, evolve differently over time, and have different number of spores in them. And the spore-bearing structures are different. 
and the spores themselves are quite magnificent to look at as well under the microscope. It's a whole other world of you can study them. Uh, and of course, you know, they come in large abundance, billions of them. <laughs> Every mushroom has loads and loads of spores to ensure its survival and to show how important they are. And of course, lots of things will eat the spores as well, so you need to create a lot. <laughs> That's just an ascospore under the microscope and beautiful shapes of spores, ascospores, uh, more ascospores, different shapes, and the basidia, the little, the little devil's devil horns. I don't know why they call them devil's horns. I'd recall it something else. Anyway, <laughs> that's another form. So once again, they all vary in form, <laughs> you know. So it's all dependent on yeah, the specific genus and species. So basidia spores with an electron microscope and spore prints. So if you have a mushroom and you put it upside down and you leave it uh, like covered with a glass and put it on paper or slide or actually probably the best thing to do is put it on al alfoil because whatever spore print it leaves, if it's white on white, white paper, you won't see it. But on alfoil, you get a good print. And they come in different beautiful colors. And it becomes artwork. You can do workshops with this. You can basically create them and put them up on, because all of them, every species or every genus will have its own spore print. Uh, that's a really good identifying feature because how it drops its spores shows you what type of fungi or what um, genus it is. Uh, it's just beautiful, isn't it? It's so gorgeous. You can cut the stipe right at the cap and then just leave it under, usually it takes about 24, up to 24 hours, probably less than that. And then you, you know, take it off carefully and you've got this gorgeous image you can frame. And hyphae, I talked a little bit about this, but this, these are just cells running together parallel to form a visible structure called the mycelium. Um, and the clamp connections and how the hyphae are, as we described earlier, based, you know, all of that matters. And there's different types of hyphae that create different structural integrity of the mushroom in the end, or the fruiting body. So the general term for like a mushroom that's not, doesn't have a cap with a stem, it's just fruit body or spore body. I think now my colleagues are more moving towards spore body because a fungus is, doesn't fruit really. It's not a flower or a fruit. I call them more flowers than fruit because they just produce naked spores that fly into the environment. So you can call them spore bodies. <laughs> and then, you know, to identify them, you can go to like the Queensland Mycological Society and go through the keys and that's where you would, all those features we just talked about, Basically, that's where you start looking for them to see what you found. And that's just for agaricus. And agaricus is normally what we call a mushroom with gills. <laughs> and that's kind of, there's actually agaricus genus.